Despite all the advances in medical science, 100% of people still die. It's true. There are no exceptions. In 2017, there were over 607,000 deaths in the UK. And yet many of us are still reluctant to talk about death and dying. One of the biggest fears is of dying. But this is a reality. It's a fact of life. I believe accepting death as a natural part of life can help you live a happier and more fulfilled life. Talking about our experiences of bereavement can reduce fear of our own death and allow us to better focus on living our lives. So let's talk about dying and start living. In 2013, I discovered Death Café. I was doing my PhD research on the right to die, looking at how different people talk about and understand human rights in an end-of-life context. As part of my research, I needed to find a study group who were comfortable talking about dying, and I found Death Café. From the very first event, I realized the value of having a safe space, an opportunity for people to talk freely about their worries. I'll give you an example. One evening, as I sat on a table with four strangers, a lady to my left described how her son had died 18 months earlier. He was a victim of knife crime and had died at the scene from his stab wounds. She spoke about his death and her grief and how she was struggling to come to terms with his death. What distressed her most was thinking that he'd died in pain. She was worried that he'd suffered. A man on my right responded to this, saying, I'm a psychotherapist. I work with families of victims killed by knife crime. And I can assure you, your son did not suffer. He would not have died in pain. He then went on to explain, when someone's stabbed, the body's initial response is a rush of endorphins that gives a feeling of warmth and well-being. By the time your son realized his wounds were serious, his body would be weakening and relaxing before he died. And as he spoke, I could feel how the stress and tension just flooded out of this lady, and she broke down. She was so relieved. No one had explained the death of her son in this way before. I'm aware that some of you might be awkward or uncomfortable speaking about death and dying especially when someone we know has been bereaved. We might be worried about upsetting them or not having the right words to say. But honestly, any words are better than no words. Even a simple, how are you today? Or, I'm sorry for your loss. I find it strange how death can be taboo when we are confronted with it on a daily basis. Not only do the people we know and love die, and we attend funerals, but we are overwhelmed by news and media updates about terror incidents, accidents, natural disasters. Our children experience graphic representations of death in films and video games. And if you're over 50, your Facebook newsfeed is likely to be displaying adverts about prepaid funeral services or will writing adverts. With so much of our personal lives on public display in today's society, there seems to be a disconnect between talking about our lives and death. And when we do talk about death, the language we use is most peculiar. Phrases such as, popped his clogs, kicked the bucket, lost their battle, often raise more questions than answers, especially in the minds of children for whom the mystery of death must be confused even further. 
We need to talk about dying in real and honest terms and let others know what's important to us. And I just point out, saying the words death or dying don't make it any more or less likely to happen. Perhaps our reluctance to talk about death is because dying, coping with serious illness, or purchasing a funeral are all examples of things people generally know very little about until they actually need to do so, until it becomes real for them and they are given a diagnosis or have to make funeral arrangements for a loved one. We don't seem to share our worries about grief, our experiences of bereavement, or our top tips on the most cost-effective funeral providers. But why not? Last year, I launched Death Cafe Kingston as part of Dying Matters Awareness Week in an attempt to address this taboo and lack of conversation. And now when I meet people and explain that I run a death cafe, their first response is usually, what's a death cafe? And their second is, ooh, that sounds morbid, but you seem really happy. <laughs> I'll try to explain. Death Cafe is authentic. It's a safe space for open and meaningful discussion that cuts through the noise of everyday chat and superficial interaction. Now, don't get me wrong, I like a bit of chit-chat as much as the next person, but... I am convinced that in this busy world, there is a real and urgent need to create time and space for people to be heard and to be listened to. In fact, when the Death Cafe sessions end, people linger. It's really hard to get them to leave. They seem reluctant to leave that space that has allowed them to be honest and vulnerable. Returning to my point that 100% of people still die, yes, it's inevitable. But by acknowledging death and speaking more openly about our concerns, we can feel liberated to embrace our lives and take advantage of the opportunities we have. The Death Cafe concept was started by a Swiss sociologist, Bernard Kretatz, under the name Café Mortel. It was brought to London in 2011 by John Underwood and his mum, Sue Barsky-Reed. To date, over 9,000 death cafes have been held in 65 different countries. Death cafes operate as a not-for-profit social franchise and have as their aim to help people make the most of their finite lives. So what happens at a death cafe is that groups of people, usually strangers, meet to enjoy tea and cake together and share their thoughts and experiences about death and dying. There's no agenda and no discussions that are off limits. Topics of conversation have included the ideal death, funerals, bereavement, online and digital memorials, what happens during and after death. We've had people who've seen ghosts and had near-death experiences. Each time is different. Now, Death Cafe is not designed as therapy or bereavement counselling, and the people who run Death Cafe, like myself, come from a variety of backgrounds. But it does seem that people's concerns can be alleviated or validated through sharing with others. I recall Stuart, a man in his late 20s, who came along. For the first two or three times, he didn't speak at all. He just listened until he felt comfortable. And the next time, he spoke at length and in detail about the death of his mother. This was his feedback afterwards. He said, there was very little opportunity to talk about death. 
Even as my mother lay dying on a hospital bed, neither the doctors nor my family spoke about her imminent death. It was all centred around her treatment and chances of survival. Five years on, this is the first time I've really spoken about the death of my mother and considered my own death. It's a very liberating feeling. <coughs> at Death Cafe, we asked participants to write a short feedback at the end of the event, including asking them, what did you appreciate about the event? Examples of some things they appreciated were recognizing that someone else may share your grief and emotions is a real comfort. The attitudes and searching for meaning and understanding is interesting to see in a world that seldom allows this conversation. It was freeing to talk about death and dying. As a result, I will reflect more on what it means to have a good death and meaningful life. And many people noticed how very easy it was to talk to strangers about death. And that's really it. It's about empowering people to have those difficult conversations. Sometimes people who have a serious or terminal illness attend Death Café. They value the opportunity to speak freely without fear of being judged or upsetting loved ones. Death Café provides a space where they can openly acknowledge their dying without having to smile and say they're fine or talk about mundane things like our great British weather. It can be very humbling to hear how people are living their last weeks or months and what's important to them in the short time that's left. It never involves working more hours or buying more stuff. It always involves spending time with people who are important to you, living in that moment, appreciating what you have. Maybe it's time to rethink our priorities. I remember Sarah, who came along to Death Café on four or five occasions before she died. Knowing that she only had a short time left meant for her that she said and did exactly as she felt. I found her sometimes brutal honesty quite refreshing. It seems people who have little time left choose their words very carefully and get straight to the point. Sarah had five growing up sons and she invited them regularly to visit, but more so in the last stages of her illness. She described how each time they left, she made sure to give them a huge hug and tell them how much she loved them, just in case it was the last time. Recently at Death Cafe, people spoke about how they would prefer to die. There seems to be an expectation in today's society that we might be able to control death, or that we have some right to influence over what should happen in our last moments. But this isn't always the case. And even if it were, very few of us might have had those conversations and shared our wishes with a loved one or a doctor so that they could be carried out. Research in 2018 shows just 7% of us have written down our wishes or preferences about the care we would like to receive if we're not able to make decisions for ourselves. Compared to birth plans that are often researched very carefully and written in great detail, there seems to be missing that conversation about how people would like to die and what should happen after their death. And this is really surprising when you think that birth and death are equally unpredictable. I would encourage you to have those discussions soon or to write your wishes down. It will spare your friends and family the arguments and uncertainty later on. 
We talk about a good death. But notions of a good death are very subjective. They'll depend on your culture, your religious beliefs, your personal experiences. Some people want to die suddenly or die in their sleep. Others want to control the manner and timing of their death. People of faith believe this will be determined by their God. I note, most people want the opportunity to die well and that the things we value in life, we also value in death, including being treated with dignity and respect. As it stands, there are no guarantees about the how or when of our own death, only that we can each try to make the most of our finite lives. Now, I don't have all the answers. You'll have to do some thinking and talking to decide what's important to you. But two things stand out for me from the many conversations I've been part of, and they are be passionate about something and don't be afraid to do things differently. And finally, we've all heard those phrases, when I retire, or when I have more money, as excuses for putting off challenges or adventures. But by accepting that your life is finite, I hope will encourage you to take advantage of your opportunities now. So try the skydive, the gym membership, the change of job. Get in touch with that friend you haven't seen for ages, or the family member you fell out with years ago over a silly argument. Do it now and live without feeling worried or unfulfilled. It's time to talk about dying and start living. Thank you. Thank you.